Today we're going to continue our series uh, by faith in uh, the 11th chapter of Hebrews, and hopefully it's challenged you. This has challenged me, and I consider faith to be one of my gifts, but it has challenged me. Sometimes life sends you through um, directions, and your journey will curve and turn and take you in places where it really challenges your faith. And uh, maybe you're in a place like that today. Well, today we're going to talk about faith that passes the test. Let me say that again. Faith that passes the test. So what we're going to do today is I'm going to have some of our men go around. They're going to pass out some sheets of paper to you that actually will be a test on everything you've heard so far the last few weeks. I'm just kidding. I'm I'm just being silly. Um, No, but usually the test comes after you've already had the material, right? So in a way, that's what we're experiencing today. So I'm going to give you just a little bit of introduction to kind of get your mind moving in the right direction. First of all, we learned what faith is in chapter 11, verse 1 through 3. Let's look at that. Now, faith is the assurance. Everybody say assurance of things hoped for, the conviction of things not seen. For by it, the people of old received their commendation. And look at verse 3. By faith we understand that the universe was created by the Word of God, so that what is seen was not made out of things that are visible. So what he does right there is he connects our faith to the very Word of God. Now I want to remind you how he started off this whole book in Hebrews chapter 1. Long ago, at many times, and in many ways, God spoke to our fathers by the prophets. But in these last days, He has spoken to us by His Son, whom He appointed the heir of all things. Listen to this. Through whom also He created the world. He is the radiance of the glory of God and the exact imprint of His nature, and He upholds the universe by the word of His power. So he's just like like the Gospel of John tells us, the whole chapter of 1 John is telling us and emphasizing the fact that Jesus is the very Word of God. In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and what? The Word was God. And so when he comes to chapter 11, he sets the foundation for what we're about to talk about. All these people of old and how they honor the Lord through faith, he connects it to the Word. By faith, we understand that the universe was created by the Word of God. The most important thing we have and know in our life is the Word of God. And Jesus is the Word of Of God, and it is the foundation of our faith. Amen. Faith believes what God says. I'm just reviewing a few things that we've had over the last few weeks. Faith believes what God says, faith acts like it's fact. Now, sometimes in life, we'll say we believe something, okay, but you don't really believe it unless you act on it. So you can say you believe God, but unless you're acting on it, you don't really believe God. So faith makes us live as an act as if we believe. Somebody say amen. Faith believes what is unseen. That's what makes it faith. If you could see it, you don't need faith. Through, fa- through our faith, God even speaks after we're gone, like we learned through the life of Abel. And by faith, we can truly walk with God like we learned through the life of of Enoch. And lastly, without faith, we can't please God. Look at verse 6 of chapter 11. Maybe you have a desire to please God with your life. You want to do what God wants you to do with your life, and when it's all over, you want God to be pleased. Well, listen to this. One of the most important truths in Scripture. Without faith, it is impossible to please Him. For whoever would, would draw near to God must believe that he exists and that he rewards. Everybody say rewards. Those who seek him. If you want to please God, you have to have faith. If we want to please God, we have to have faith. Not just as individuals, but as a church family. We must have faith. So with that thinking, let's move to our uh, passage for today. Verse 17, let me read it again. By faith, Abraham, when he was tested 
offered up Isaac, and he who had received the promises was in the act of offering up his only son, of whom it was said, through Isaac shall your offspring be named. He considered that God was able even to raise him from the dead, from which figuratively speaking, he did receive him back. So by faith, Abraham, when he was tested, everybody say tested. You're not going to want to hear this, but your faith is going to be tested. God is going to test your faith. Turn to your neighbor on your right and say, God is going to test your faith. And the person on your left, if you don't have anybody on your left, just go back to that person on your right and say, God is going to test your faith. We don't like to amen that, do we? Some of you might be right smack dab in the middle. We say that in the country. Right smack dab in the middle of a big test that God has you, has for you in your life. Well, you're going to want to listen to how Abraham handled his test. But first, the story of Abraham that the the author of Hebrews is referencing is from Genesis 22. And that starts with, after these things, God tested Abraham. So it's just important. I'm going to run through the these things part because the test is coming after he's already had the material. Amen. So first of all, Abraham's just kind of minding his own business with his family and everything. And God shows up and says, Abraham, I want you to go. I want you to leave this land, I want you to leave your people, and I want you to go. And Abraham went. And God gave a great promise. He says, I'm going to bless you and your family, and through you, I'm going to bless all the peoples, the nations of the world. What an awesome promise. And then later on, God came and gave that promise again and did it through a special promise covenant, which was speaking towards the cross. And when Jesus would come, awesome. And then we know Abraham went through some challenges of his faith, and he wasn't always so faithful. A few times he lied about who Sarah was. He acted like she was his sister because he was scared. He acted in fear. He didn't want to get killed. He didn't want her to get killed, so he lied. Okay, But he went through a journey, and the big thing that God used to grow his faith was that promise that, hey, through you, I'm, we're gonna, you're going to have many nations. You're going to be the father of many nations. And then Abraham said, but how in the world can I be the father of many nations if I don't have a son? And we all know that he had to wait and wait. God promised, you're going to be the father of many nations, and it'll come through your own son, which was hard to believe because Abraham was already old. And do you know how long he had to wait before God gave him that son? Do you know? 25 years he had to wait for that son. So Abraham and Sarah have been through some stuff, okay? Can you imagine 25 years of waiting on a promise and waiting and waiting? And then at one time they tried to take care of it themselves. They tried to help God out. You know that story, right? So Abraham has a son through Hagar, and that didn't turn out so well right? No. We, we try to do that on our own sometimes, don't we? Everybody say, uh-huh. That's the way young folks say amen. Uh-huh. Yeah, we try to help God out, but Abraham is growing in all this time, and he's learning, and he's understanding that God is who he says he is, and the only way I can have rest is to believe what God says. And then 25 years later, through all the waiting and the doubting and the fear that God might not do what he said he would do, and then being full of faith again, God showed up and gave him a son. And we know that story. And then at this time, when God shows up for the test, we don't really know how old Isaac was. We know he was, he was old enough to be able to help and go and to carry the wood and things. He could, he could have been as old as his late 20s, you know, or he could have been younger. We don't really know that for sure. What does the Bible say about being tested by God? Proverbs 17.3 says this, The crucible is for silver and the furnace is for gold, and the Lord tests hearts. Jeremiah 17.10, I, the Lord, search the heart and test the mind to give every man according to his ways, according to the fruit of his deeds. And Psalm 26.2 says this, Prove me, O Lord, and try me. Test my mind. Test my heart and my mind. God is going to test you. So understanding that, let's take a look at how Abraham handled his test. Number one, first, he obeyed God. 
It says, by faith, Abraham, when he was tested, offered up Isaac. He obeyed. That's a great place to start. Let's look at this in Genesis 22, 1 through 5. After these things, God tested Abraham and said to him, Abraham. And he said, here I am. He said, take your son, your only son, Isaac, whom you love, and go to the land of Moriah and offer him there as a burnt offering on one of the mountains, which I will tell you. And then I want you to see right here is that Abraham, not only to obey, he obeyed immediately. In verse 3, it says, so Abraham rose early in the morning. Everybody say, early in the morning. Now, we have no idea what was going on that whole night. Could you imagine what in the world was going on in Abraham's mind? We can't even imagine that. I mean, I waited 25 years for Isaac. This is the big thing I've been looking for in my life and waiting for. And Isaac shows up and he's growing up and I'm falling in love with him. I love him. He's awesome. The promise is being fulfilled. And then just one day God shows up and says, I want you to take Isaac and sacrifice him. Oh my goodness. Just imagine the battle that's going on in his mind when God says that. We don't get to see that. But all we know is how he responded is that he obeyed and he obeyed immediately. He got up early in the morning. I'm just going to speculate that most of us would probably might not even set the clock and just say, I'm going to wake up when I wake up, or I'm not going to try to hurry. But really, we know he didn't sleep all night, probably, right? He got up early in the morning and saddled his donkey. And I'm just going to throw this in. I like that phrase. Some of you are at a place in your life where it's time to saddle your donkey and obey. But I'll move on. Then, then so he obeyed. He obeyed immediately, and he removed potential distractions. This is one thing that really stands out to me in the story. Well, let me read uh, from verse 3, and I'll get there. Um, He he saddled his donkey, took two of his young men with him and his son Isaac, and he cut the wood for the burnt offering and arose and went to the place which God had told him. And on the third day, Abraham lifted up his eyes and saw the place from afar. Now watch what he does. Then Abraham said to his young men, stay here. Stay here with the donkey. But he said, stay here. And here's what I think he was doing, okay? I'm speculating. It doesn't say exactly why, but I'm thinking, hey, these guys don't know what's going on or what's about to go on, okay? So I'm just going to have them stay here. It's just going to be me and Isaac going up there, okay? So sometimes in life, when God gives you a directive that is a challenging directive, that not everybody's going to understand the why behind what God is doing, and they're certainly going to doubt that you would be following through with it, sometimes the best thing you can do is to eliminate the potential distraction and hurdle to do what God has called you and told you to do. Makes sense? So I think it was wisdom to leave these folks behind so that when he and Isaac were going to have to start focusing on what was going to be happening. He wasn't going to have anybody challenging him or questioning him, trying to stop him and say, that was not God. There's no way that was God. Does anybody know what I'm talking about? Somebody say, amen. All right. What does the Bible say about obedience? When Samuel was speaking to Saul, Saul had, you remember Saul was the first king of God's people. Um, He disobeyed. He had a specific directive from God, and he disobeyed, and he, he, he was supposed to annihilate the Amalekites, totally destroy everything, not keep anything that they have. But when Samuel shows up, he's kept some of the choice animals and, and the, uh, the wealth, and he said he did it because he wanted to make a sacrifice to the Lord. And here's what Samuel said. Has the Lord as great delight in, a, in burnt offerings and sacrifices as in obeying the voice of the Lord? Behold, to obey is better than sacrifice, and to listen than the fat of rams. Let me just challenge you here. You know, sometimes we think coming to church, being a part of church, doing churchy things, builds us us points on the good side. But if you are right now living in disobedience to the Word of God, all that doesn't make up for it. Has the Lord as great a delight in your sacrifice as in obedience? The word, of the, the word of God is the foundation of everything. And if you really believe God, you obey His Word. The reward of obedience is the presence of God. I love this out of John chapter 14, verse 21. Whoever has my commandments and keeps them, 
He it is who loves me. And he who loves me will be loved by my Father. And here it is. And I will love him and manifest myself to him. That's a promise. If you obey me and live in obedience, I will show up in your life. That's good stuff. So first Abraham obeyed. And now I want to watch you, want you to see why he was able to act and, and obey God. Because there was other things going on. He who had received the promises was in the act of offering up. Everybody say act. Act of offering up his only son. Of whom it was said through Isaac shall your offspring be named. Let me show you the things that Abraham was believing. His initial promises came in chapter 12 of Genesis. Now the Lord said to Abraham, go from your country and your kindred and your father's house to the land that I will show you. Now listen to all of these promises. There are seven specific promises. And I will make of you a great nation. And I will bless you and make your name great so that you will be a blessing. I will bless those who bless you. And him who dishonors you, I will curse. And in you, all the families of the earth shall be blessed. And later on, God came to Abraham again, and Abraham was struggling, okay? Because he's not really seeing the fruition of the things God said. And in chapter 15, listen to this. After these things, the word of the Lord came to Abraham. Don't pass by that too quick. The word of the Lord came to Abraham in a vision. Fear not, Abraham, I am your shield. Your reward shall be very great. But Abraham said, O Lord God, what will you give me? For I continue childless, and the heir of my house is Eliezer of Damascus, not even my own son. Abraham said, Behold, you have given me no offspring, and a member of my household will be my heir. And behold, listen to this, the word of the Lord came to him. This man shall not be your heir. Your very own son shall be your heir. And he brought him outside and said, Look toward the heaven and number the stars if you are able to number them. Then he said to him, So shall your offspring be. And he believed the Lord and he counted it to him as righteousness. I want to point out first that everything Abraham believed came by the word of the Lord. The word. Of the Lord. And this is what was filling Abraham and the promises that he was holding on to. Jesus' disciples were with him one day and they said, Jesus, what is it that we're supposed to be doing to be doing the works of God? What is it we're supposed to be doing? And this is what Jesus said. Well, let's read the verse out of uh, John chapter 6. Then they said to him, What must we do to be doing the works of God? And Jesus answered, This is the work of God that you believe him whom he sent. You believe him. He is the word and you believe him. This is the work. Do you know how simple Jesus just made things? You may be sitting there thinking about what is my life supposed to be about? What's the purpose of my life? What am I supposed to be doing? Well, it better start right on this statement. Believe Jesus, believe. We're called believers. Do you know how often that bugs me because so often we don't believe? We're called believers. You get that? Everybody say, "Uh uh-huh. The test of faith will put you in a place where you will have to act on what you believe about God. You may be in the middle of the test or the test may be on its way, but the test is going to put you in a place where you will have to act on what you really believe About God. And this is what was happening. All of these promises that God had made to Abraham through his word is what Abraham was struggling to believe and what he was going to be tested on. And what did he do? Number three, his thoughts honored God. When the test comes, the crisis of belief comes, Abraham's thoughts honored God. Look at verse 19. He considered that God was able even to raise him from the dead from which figuratively speaking, he did receive him. You know what that word consider means? Consider means to have extended deliberative thought on something and to arrive at an opinion or belief. So before he ever acted, 
Note, before he ever acted, he was thinking. This is where the battle started, and this is where the battle has to be won, right here, before he ever acted. Listen, his thoughts honored God. When the crisis of belief comes, God gives a command that that he does not, that Abraham doesn't understand. But what does he understand? God has made lots of promises to me. I believe that God is true. I believe that his word is true and it will not fail. And so in his mind, he honored the Lord. And through all those things that he did know, even though there was much he could not see, what he could not understand, his thoughts honored God. And his thoughts were full of faith. So he said, well, this might not be what God does, but if I do what God tells me to do, he must just going to be going to raise Isaac from the dead. Because no matter what happens, God's going to fulfill the promises he's made to me and he's going to do it through Isaac because he promised to. You know, the first place where we lose, we fail the test. Right here. Rather than letting the word of God fill your mind, rather than letting your mind focus on the word of God and the promises of God, we get our mind on something else. We're either going to believe what God is telling us or we're going to believe what the enemy is telling us. Listen to this. We're either going to believe and have faith what God is telling us or we're going to believe what the enemy tells us and let fear God what we do. This is the choice of life. Am I going to live by fear or am I going to live by faith in the Word of God? When we're in a crisis of belief, the battle will be in your mind between faith and fear. Will you focus your thoughts on what you're scared about or will you focus your thoughts on what you believe about God? And Abraham honored the Lord with his thoughts. Let me just challenge you here, Philippians 4 8. Finally, brothers, whatever is true, whatever is honorable, whatever is just, whatever is pure, whatever is lovely, whatever is commendable, if there is any excellence, if there's anything worthy of praise, think about these things. The reason Abraham was able to act in faith is because his thoughts were full of faith. First, his thoughts honored God. And number four, his words honored God. He spoke in faith. Listen again to um, verse 5 of chapter 22. Then Abraham said to his young men, stay here with the donkey. And here, here he goes. I and the boy will go over there and worship and come again to you. He spoke in faith. So first his mind is full of faith and he's choosing, I'm going to believe the word of God. Then his mouth is full of faith. So the words he said honored the truth he knew about God. And so everything he said, even in the midst of this crisis of belief, honored the Lord. And he spoke in faith. He knew. You see what he's saying? He said, me and the boy are going over there and me and the boy are coming back. He spoke in faith, even though he was clueless how that was going to happen. Good stuff. What the Bible says about our words. Proverbs 13, 3. Whoever guards his mouth preserves his life. He who opens wide his lips comes to ruin. Matthew 12. For out of the abundance of the heart, the mouth speaks. The good person out of his good treasure brings forth good. And the evil person out of his evil treasure brings forth evil evil. I tell you, listen to this, I tell you on the day of judgment, people will give account for every careless word they speak. For by your words, you will be justified. And by your words, you will be condemned. There's a big illustration of this in the Bible, okay? In Numbers 14, God had sent 12 spies into the promised land. You know the story. 
And after their time spying out the land, they came back. Ten of them gave a bad report, and two of them gave a good report. Ten of them came back, and their minds were full of fear. They weren't believing the promises that God had spoken. They were not believing what God had already done visibly. And they were not full of faith. Their minds were full of fear. They were believing what the enemy was telling them. And they came back and their mouth was full of fear. And when you speak in fear, you are despising God. That's what God says. You despised me by what you said. And do you know what God did? Do you know what he did? He said, the very words you have spoken in my hearing is what I will do. You will die in this wilderness. Did you hear that? The very words you have spoken in my hearing. If you don't believe me, you go to Numbers 14 and you read it. The very words you have spoken in my hearing is what I'm going to do. You will die in this wilderness. And so God made them wait in the wilderness. How many years? 40 years. So that that generation would die out. And you know who lived and was able to go into the promised land? The two who spoke rightly about God. Who were they? Caleb and Joshua. Lots of people with names Caleb and Joshua, and this is one of the reasons why. They spoke in faith about God and God honored. Now look, this is something you might not know, okay? That, the, that God keeps a record in heaven. Listen to this. God keeps a record in heaven of those who speak well of him. Let me show you. Malachi chapter 3, verse 16 through 18. Then those who feared the Lord spoke with one another. And the Lord paid attention. I like that. And the Lord paid attention and heard them. And a book of remembrance was written before him of those who feared the Lord and esteemed his name. That is good stuff. It is really important what you say. We don't need to pass by that. Before Abraham was able to act in faith, his mind was full of faith, believing the word of God. And his mouth was full of faith, speaking well of God. And that's our challenge. When the test comes and we are clueless what God's going to do, our mind and our mouth need to be full of faith. And we need to honor God with our mind. In our mouth. Number five, he was fully surrendered to God. Nothing was off limits for God. Let's look at chapter 22, verse 2. He said, Take your son, your only son, Isaac, whom you love. This wasn't just anything he was asking him to do. He was, at, he was confronting him at the most precious point in his life. And I want you to mark this down. I think I have it on the screen. God confronts us at our point of greatest resistance. Let's think about that. God confronts us at the, our point of greatest resistance. The one thing, if Abraham was going to say, oh God, I can't do that, was this. And that's where God showed up and brought the test. That's what God does. And so my challenge for you is, what is that thing in your life that you're holding on so tightly? It's precious. It may be good. It is the precious thing in your life. And there may, you may even secretly have thoughts that, God, please don't mess with this. Please don't mess with this. God's going to mess with it. Bank on it. So you might as well right now, before the test comes, you might as well right now, go ahead and say, God, I lay this at your feet. Not my will, but your will be done. I lay this at your feet. This is yours. 
God will confront us at our place of greatest resistance. That which is most precious to us, if it's not him, God will confront it. This is why Jesus could say, if anyone would come after me, let him deny himself. Take up his cross daily and follow me. For whoever would save his life will lose it. But whoever loses his life for my sake will save it. So with that, I give you this question. Is there anything in your life that's off limits for God? Is there anything that's off limits for God? What we see by Abraham is, no, nothing's off limits. God came to him at the most precious thing in his life, and Abraham obeyed God, and he surrendered. So how did Abraham handle his test? He obeyed. He believed God, and he acted in his belief. And the only reason he could do that is because his thoughts honored God. His mind was full of faith. His words honored God. His words were full of faith. And he was fully surrendered. Nothing was off limits. God will test you in this. You'll either live your life by fear, making your decisions, believing what the enemy is telling you. Listen, you'll either live your life by fear, making your decisions, believing what the enemy is telling you, or you will live your life by faith, making your decisions, believing in God and His Word. And this will be a daily challenge. That's why Jesus says, take up your cross daily. It will be a daily challenge. You may have done well yesterday. Today is a test. And today you're choosing, am I going to live in fear or am I going to live in faith? Is what I do going to be motivated by my fear or is it going to be motivated by my faith? So where is the struggle that you have today? Is your struggle in your thought life? How do you approach, how do you attack that? You need to fill your mind with right things. The devil and all his demons are working every day overtime to fill your mind with wrong things. Every direction you look, listen, go. The enemy is trying to fill your mind with lies. And he's trying to fill you with fear. You need to take hold of what goes in your mind. You need to read the Word, study the Word, listen to worship music that sings the Word. And there's a lot of baloney on TV. You might just ought to limit what you're watching. Pray about what you're watching. Be careful. Fill your mind with good things that will help you walk in faith. Is your problem... Is the area of struggle with you and your words? Hey, we all struggle with this. How do I honor the Lord with what I say? I fill my mind with right things. Because you know what? The mouth speaks what's going on in here. If you hear somebody speak something that's bad about somebody, they thought it first. If you hear God, if you hear somebody speak something good about somebody, they thought it first. So if you do number, the first thing and fill your mind with right things, fill your mind with the word, be careful what goes in your mind, you are filling your mind with what you're going to speak. And then you need to let it out. Speak words of faith. Words spoken in faith help to boost and strengthen your spirit. It helps to boost your faith. Did you know that? Say it. Say you believe what God says. I believe God is going to deliver me. I believe God is going to raise my son from the dead. He is going to fulfill his promises. Say it, say it, so it will fill you with faith. How are you going to have strong faith? You soak your mind with right things about God and you speak it. And when somebody comes in your presence and says something that's full of fear and doesn't honor the Lord, you speak the truth about God. You can do it with grace and love, but you speak the truth about God. You speak the truth about God. You don't let the name of God be demeaned in your presence. 
Amen? We all speak wrong. So let's just make up for it. My youth pastor used to say he can't wait for the day when like, students are just walking down the school and somebody might bump their head and they would say, oh, Jesus, or something like that. And all the godly students would say, praise his name. He's awesome. He's king of kings. Well, i just throw that out there. Maybe that'll happen one day. But let's make sure we speak well of Jesus. Everybody say, amen. Is there something you need to surrender to God? Is there something you're holding on to, something that has been off limits to God? Is that your area of struggle? And today you need to give that to the Lord. And maybe all these things, you're okay, but the Lord has spoken to you, and you just need to step and obey. Something in your life, God has said, you've been thinking right, you've been speaking right, and and you're willing to give Him anything, but you just haven't stepped Today's the day you need to step and obey. Now's the time to make things right with God.